You are now listening to the Curtis King Podcast. What's going on, music producers, and welcome to a new episode of the Curtis King Podcast. For those of you that are listening for the first time on the traditional podcast platforms, this is a podcast specifically for music producers, but definitely for thinkers and creatives alike. We like to put an extra emphasis on mental health and not just the music. We want to say thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed today's episode, feel free to share it with a friend, but definitely leave us some commentary and some ratings. Those ratings help us to get discovered by more people. I think the last time I checked, we were number 81 in the U.S. overall of music commentary podcasts. It's pretty damn good. I'm not mad at that. I, you know, I, I didn't know where we were at, so I've been tracking that as of late. But thanks to your ratings and thanks to your comments, it helps us move up. That being said, if you want to watch a video format of this, which is something that we do every Monday, just like these podcasts come out, come join us at Curtis King TV on YouTube, Curtis King with two S's TV, and come be a part of the community. It's a really tight knit community, a really supportive community of producers, primarily producers that understand the importance of not just the music, but also our mental health. Which brings me today to the topic of conversation, 10 ways to cook up beats more consistently. I guess I can add a little bit of a little caveat to that. 10 ways to cook up fire beats more consistently. Maybe that'll be the clickbaity title. But I started thinking about this when over the last weekend, uh, my homie, oh gosh, Leotis and Nicholas Gray. And you've already seen the vlog. If you haven't seen the vlog, go check it out. It's on my YouTube channel of the Studio Rebuild. For those of you that have already been watching and listening to the podcast, you know, the podcast looks a little bit different. That wall back there looks a little bit brighter than usual. It's not the uh, crazy foam on the background as it once was. It's not the crazy, uh, you know, the insane asylum uh, foam positing wedges that are on the wall. We got rid of those. And I feel like we really, like, I feel like I really have a studio for the first time. And I got to say, shout out to my homie, Gosh and Nicholas Gray, because they really decked me out in terms of just, I have a, I have a studio home that when I walk into this, it feels like it's someone else's space. And that's a good thing. It feels like I walk into here and I'm like, I don't want to mess nothing up. I don't want to, you know, mess the wiring up because my biggest issue in studio feng shui is my wires. My cord management is trash. I'll be the first one to tell you that. I don't know what it is. Even after I've organized it, I just, I know what it is. My mind's all, all over the place. And I always have a necessity to try to find different, th- different things to use at the same time. And I got smart plugs and all this other stuff. But what's super dope is the fact that these 3D walls up here um, really bring another dimension in this room. It just, I don't know, as we're talking about the necessity to cook up beats more consistently, I think about the things that were hindering my ability to create about a year ago when I was in here. When I was in here about a year ago, there were issues that I was having that I did not realize were dealing with my environment. And maybe many of you are dealing with some really tight quarters or you're dealing with a room or a space where you're sharing it with others and you feel like you can't be your, your, your true and natural self. I understand that. But even in having a, I've been there, but even in having my own space, which this room is, I still feel like it was just clutter. It felt like the room was closing in on me. And maybe that's more in my head than anything else. I'm sure it is. But as I was looking around, I'm like, this doesn't feel like a place to make music. It feels like a, a room that I'm making music in. It doesn't feel like a studio. And the things that start making it feel like a studio now, these panels that are up here, the just how everything is laid out and how dead the sound sounds in here. Now, you probably can hear some folks out there. They're cutting the grass and they're cutting the lawn. So please you know, excuse them. We still haven't soundproofed the room. <laughs> but um, that being said, I, I, I wanted to be able to walk in here and feel like Yes, this is my place of business and not just a expensive utility closet, which it felt like for a long time. It felt like when I walked in here and it didn't really inspire 
ideas. I had to kind of like ignore the environment altogether. And who wants to do that? What's the purpose of all these LED lights? What's the purpose of the equipment that we have? What's the purpose of buying all of this stuff if we're going to only ignore it for the sake of focusing on music? And, and, you know, if anything that I get in this room, I always try to tell myself it's going to enhance something. It's going to enhance creativity. It's going to enhance my excitement to get in here. But I got to say, not until now, as I'm looking up at this and I'm looking at all the different factors that make up this room, not until now have I been this excited about jumping in here. And so I encourage you to l watch the vlog and just, you know, see just even how how getting taking everything out the room, because that's how we did it first, Took, taking everything out of this room first and being able to see it as a like an empty canvas, a blank canvas. Gave me a sigh of relief that I cannot explain. So maybe that's what you got to do with your space. Maybe it's about that time for some spring cleaning. Do it. I highly suggest it. It was like I took the, the biggest creative exhale by just getting stuff out of the room first because we had to clean it first before we put anything up. But, um, you know, redoing the lights in here and just making sure everything has its own space. Because I think over time you'll add stuff and not necessarily think about the room from a zoomed out point of view. You're just thinking about it in context of, well, this needs, I need this and I need this and I need this. Not necessarily how they all play for one another, but that's it. Uh, that's all I want to talk about with that. Now I want to get into this 10 ways to cook up beats more consistently. This is a question that I find rears its head up in many different ways, right? Because I do Q&A at the end of my Flocation live streams. I get DMs from after live streams that I've done and folks ask pretty similar questions. And most of them, I can tell you, most of them circulate around finding motivation or finding purpose in the work that they're doing that these producers are doing so that they can make beats more consistently, but not just make beats, make fire beats. Who doesn't want to make their best work? So I compiled a list of 10 things that, you know, some things are, you've probably heard before. I know you've heard before. And then some things are very um, Curtis King like. And, uh, you know, for those who don't know what that means, you'll see that in a second. <laughs> so let's go ahead and just run down this list. I got it right here on my iPhone. I wrote this list and compile them based upon the advice that I have been given over the last few years. And so the first one is be clear on why you even make beats. It may seem like a very obvious answer or may seem like a very obvious question for many of you, but be clear on why you even make beats. Why do you make beats? Well, I make beats to sell them. Well, why do you make beats to sell them? Because I need to make money. Well, here's the issue with when you say that to yourself, right? Ask yourself dumb questions. You get dumb answers. You ever heard that saying? Um, be clear on why you are doing what you're doing, because if you say I am doing I am only I'm only making beats to sell beats so I can make a living to make money, then your brain starts to go into its database and say, couldn't we find an easier way to make money than this? Right. Why are we putting ourselves through all of this stress? And I know that's not what you want. I know that you would rather make make music and, and, and have that make you money. But the truth of the matter is your brain is going to start to dig and try to figure out all the different ways and different reasons why you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So I think it's important to identify why you want to make beats, because that is the DNA of the the motivation that you're seeking. If you are doing something and don't know the purpose of why you're doing it, if I told you to just get up out of your seat right now and look into a corner of the room and hold your nose and pull one of your legs up behind your butt and stand on one leg for 10 minutes, the first question you would have is why? Why in the hell am I doing that? That sounds silly. Well, a lot of us do things that are not as obviously silly, but still pull us away from why our initial why even is. So it's important for you to identify what your why is. If you don't know why you're sitting down to make beats, and I mean deeper than just the money, the money is a byproduct of that, but you don't control that. All you do is make a product, create a website, promote that website, 
And then other people make decisions whether or not to buy from you. So you got to take yourself away from those factors that are out of your control. Why do you make music? For me, I always say it. Music is medicine for me. The same way that people will go to Walgreens and CVS or whatever your local drugstore is for medicine when they have a headache. I go to music when I need internal healing. Meditation is another thing I'll go to. Walking, praying, church, a lot of things that I go to for that. Music just happens to be one of those that allows me to get out all of the energy that is within me. The energy that doesn't really escape in any other way. Doesn't matter if I'm doing physical fitness. Doesn't matter if I'm like working out or whatever it is. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Does not quite add up to the creative journey that starting from scratch, starting from a kick, starting from a key, starting from a VST, a plug-in, starting from the very bare basics of a melodic loop. Nothing gives me that same feeling. To go on that journey, to know that the sound started off as one sound and then somehow is this cinematic masterpiece that we created after four or five hours. I, I live for that. I love that. That makes me a more well-rounded human being. And this is exactly what goes through my brain as I sit down to make beats so that when I get into places, excuse me, I got a little runny nose. Soon as I get to a place where I feel like, what is the purpose of this beat? This beat is not that good. I'm not feeling it. I don't feel encouraged by it. I return back to that why. I return back to the fact that this experience alone, no matter what the result of the beats is, this experience alone is a blessing. So that's number one. Be clear on why you even make beats. Number two is a little bit more practical. Restrict your session times. This is the purpose, the foundation of the 10 minute beat challenge. If you've never heard me describe this 10 minute beat challenge that that actually inspired the beat timer plugin that we have uh, at beattimer.com, one T, then I'll explain that to you right now. The 10 minute beat challenge is a way for you to go through stress training as a music producer. You put 10 minutes on the clock and you try your best to make a complete beat to, to your best of your ability. What it does is that it provides you strength training so that you get in the habit of making decisions without thinking, moving without thinking, going without thinking, taking chances and risk without second guessing. That's the purpose of this 10 minute challenge. So I actually believe that even if you work a job or you have other responsibilities like school, and you're like, I cannot wait to work on music. I still say, and this may feel counterproductive to what you're trying to do. I still say, restrict your session times. Your brain works a lot differently under pressure. Your brain, when it realizes that it only has a short window of time to do things, you leave yourself less time to second guess things. You leave yourself a lot less time to, you know, oh, I'm going to turn this into a, a, a quasi- uh, you know, uh, this is a beat creating session, but it's also a YouTube researching session. It stops you from doing those things that they may seem like they're tied into one another because you're trying to learn one thing to do one thing. But you got to be able to have some self-control and cut yourself off from saying, look, I'm not going on YouTube right now because I know that once I get on there, the timeline is literally designed to keep me on there. Why would I jump out of what I'm already doing, which is making beats, to go somewhere where they want me to not make beats? They want me to consume the information in front of my face. You go on one tutorial and then you're like, damn, this person brings up a great answer or they bring up a great point about something else I had no idea I needed to research. Then you go research that. And all of a sudden you're on a rabbit hole. Then all of a sudden you come back to that beat and you've lost the initial momentum that you had that pushed you into looking for that information. So I highly suggest that you restrict your beat making sessions, right? So if you, if you normally go, like say you have a nine to five and you come home and you, you know, it's, 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 it's now five 30, you eight, you, 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 you showered. And now you're like, you know, it's time to cook up six o'clock, six 30 rolls around. Maybe it's only a six to 10 instead of a six to midnight, six to two. Right. Plus, you got to you know, there, there's other factors that obviously go into this when we talk about giving our ears some rest. But I think that 
when you restrict your time, you'll be surprised. At first, it's going to be frustrating. But what you're going to find the more you do it is that you will start to do things in that time period that you normally wouldn't do until the last few hours of those marathon sessions. When you restrict your timing, it doesn't give your brain an opportunity to do too much talking to you, too much thinking, or that part of your brain that does all that overthinking. It doesn't give your brain enough time to do that. So restrict your timing. That's the second one. Third one, study what has worked for you. For those of you that went to my music pr producer power course, you've heard me say this before, and you know exactly what I'm getting ready to get into. It's the first time I'm really saying it here on a public platform. But study what has worked for you. Many times we are frustrated that we can't make beats as great as the ones we've already done, and we stop there. But you literally have the stems, the project files, and the DNA for what made that work. There's a few different factors I want you to pay attention to as you study your beats. You can make it five beats, five to ten beats. I think five would give you a really accurate number to draw an average from. But take five of your best beats, five to ten of your best beats, right? And what you want to do is study specific things about them. And there may be things that are obvious, or maybe not so obvious, but let me go ahead and break it down. First thing, count the average amount of instruments you used in your beats. This is so crucial because it helps you define your goals as you sit down and make beats. As you sit down and, you know, those times that you feel like I could do anything and I'm about to make, oh, man, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a little bit of some of this, make a little bit of some of this. They often frustrate you more times than they inspire you because you don't know what to do first. You don't know where to go next. If you knew that on average, your best beats only had about eight instruments, well, you could start to lay those out really easily. You know what direction to go in. It's really easy for you to know what's going to be added to this, right? Aside from that, it's just going to be up to your creativity to see how you want to freak those eight to 10 instruments. So count the average number of instruments that you use. And I'm talking about count them all as one, right? Or not all as one, but each individual one as one. So kicks, snares, hi-hats. Don't put those all as drums. Put those all as individual instruments, right? Because every sound counts. Every sound is important. Uh, loops, right? Count how many loops you're using in that. And then once you have that, keep that stored in your brain because I also want you to do another thing. I want you to note not only how long those sessions were, and obviously if you have the Beat Timer plug-in, that'll allow you to time your sessions, but also, FL Studio, I'm not sure about other dolls, but FL Studio has, if you push F11, has these project settings that'll tell you how long your session time has been. It's not always accurate because you could leave your window open and it's still counting that, but at least it'll give you a good idea of how long you were cooking up. Take the average session times. There's calculators that'll help you do that for time. See what the average session times are. But in addition to that, <clears throat> something different I want you to check out is, I want you to note the time of the day that you cook those beats up. Was it morning? Was it nighttime? Was it afternoon? Right? There's something called the sleep chronotype. You should take that quiz. Look it up. Sleep chronotype quiz. It's going to show how your personality type basically has a schedule that meets you at your most productive. Some people's schedule, they're, they're most productive at Midnight or four in the morning, five or six in the morning, right? Some people are supremely, supremely productive at nine in the morning, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a.m. Depending on what sleep chronotype you are, and they're all separated between different animals, depending on which, which one you are, it will help you understand why it probably lines up with your best beats. If you're someone that like me, for instance, I'm a bear chronotype. That means that between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., you're going to see me at my prime, at my best. This is when my brain is the sharpest. This is after I've, I've eaten. This is after, you know, I've, I've done my meditation, after I've had all of my morning regimen. I can get into here and I'm feeling like, yes, yes, I'm ready. It's no mystery to me. 
And I'm not saying that you're going to only make your best beats in these hours, but I'm saying that you want to look into it if there's a pattern there. I'm, I am a pattern tracker. I love to track patterns and see if there's something that's going on here that's telling me a different story that I could not see before. And that's one of them. Check the time of the day that you're making beats as well. So they're going to conclude that third one, which is study what has worked for you. Fourth, I believe that's fourth. Yes. Lose loops, lose, use loops for inspiration and primers. I don't care what you feel about loops, right? You, these purest points of views about loops are so nerdy sometimes. Producers don't realize how nerdy they are. I don't care who, I don't care what OG says it. I don't care what season producer says it. It is corny. It's corny. It's cheesy. Let's get over it. It's an opportunity for, first of all, other producers to generate income out here. And it's also an opportunity for you to draw off of the, the, the inspiration of other ideas that pull you out of your comfort zone. And so I say use loops for inspiration and primers so that you can cook up beats more consistently. If you're not already using, if you already use them, you already know the benefit of this. But if you're not already using them, really look into them because it's going to give you an opportunity to consistently draw from places that you necessarily wouldn't draw from because you didn't create that. So it's a pretty interesting one, uh, pretty obvious one, I would say. But uh, and then also too, they're primers. When you think about something that primes you up, something that 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 gets you in that mode, I'll do these ten minute beat challenges in my live stream location every Tuesday and Thursday at four p.m. Pacific time. I'll do three ten minute beat challenges, and by the fourth beat or the fourth or the, the first beat, whatever you want to consider it, I start working on, I'm ready to go. My energy's in the right place. I already know what it feels like to move without thinking. I already know, like, yo, I'm in that mode. I'm good. So don't be shy and don't be prejudging the use of loops, especially when we're talking about training you as a music producer. So that's one, two, three, four. And we're going to do the fifth one. I'm going to go to a quick commercial break. But the fifth one, keep a level head about your beats, no matter how good or bad they are. I think so many times we put an emphasis on this string of beats is the worst beats that I've made. I'm having a bad week. I'm having a bad month. And, you know, then we'll do the opposite when we have like, yo, I'm on fire. Nobody can do anything to me. Nobody could even touch me. I am blazing. I am on. Oh, my gosh. Like, look, it's lit. It's crazy. I got this. We put so much emphasis on the good and the bad that we really shouldn't. We really should just look at this as, look, it's always good, even when it's not its best. It's always good because I have an opportunity to cook. It's always good because I'm here. It's always good because I have a computer or I have a, 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 a piece of hardware. It's always good because I could be dead. It's always good because I am right the free. I keep saying it, but I am right here and I can make music. It is all good. And even when the beats are not, keep a level head. Do to your best of your ability. If you want to consistently make beats, you cannot be so emotionally involved. I know it sounds count. No, it sounds counter to what the purpose of music is because it is a very emotional and, and passionate experience. But you have to be able to get into a even kill space, no matter your personality type that doesn't get too high on the highs or too low on the lows. Why? Because both of them have something in common. They're temporary. So what I look at these are as experiences. They're always learning experiences. When I do something good, I learn something. But I learn a lot more when I do something I don't like. It tells me a lot more about my decision making. And I find myself getting in that headspace of seeing things that I don't like or hearing things that I don't like when I'm doing my 10 minute beat challenges. When I do those, I start to judge like, damn, I should really be able to squeeze out more out of this experience or this beat than I am in this 10 minutes. And when I get into that place, what I start to ask questions is a process of elimination that says, well, why don't you have more time? 10 minutes is a long time, right? You take 10 minutes to watch a, 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 a pot of wa water boil. That's going to, it feels like it's going to take a long time. When you watch a pot of water, it, takes like, it feels like it takes a long time. 10 minutes feels like a long time. When you're hungry and you got something in the oven, 
10 minutes feels like a long time, or the air fryer feels like a long time. But why is it that when we're pressured under the circumstances, it's because we're thinking too much. For me, I know I can speak for that. I'm thinking too much about all the things that I want to do and I'm not doing enough of it. So I think it's a very natural place for us to get emotional and get high on our highs and low on our lows. But I think the ultimate goal should be to be unmoved, not emotionally dormant, not emotionally uninvolved, but to realize that I made a good beat. That's fire. All right, let's work on something else. You know what? This is not my best beat. But damn, that what I did with those hi hats, it's probably something I'd do again. Try your best to keep a very, a very level head about it because no matter what, after all, this is this is one beat of a million that you will have the pleasure to make. That being said, we're gonna get into the last five after this commercial break, but first and foremost. Shout out to our sponsor, Voclia Doubler, which turns your voice into MIDI. Oh, my goodness. You're going to learn a little bit more about that in just a second. I'll see you after this. The Curtis King podcast is proudly sponsored by the Voclia Doubler. What is the Doubler? Well, I think better than telling you, I should show you. You trying to tell me I can use this microphone to make beats, to make melodies, to make chord progressions. I can use my voice. I'm all in. Pretty cool, right? Check this out. The Voclia Doubler represents the future of making music. The Voclia Doubler is a real-time voice recognition MIDI controller. It offers up a never-before-seen way to translate your musical ideas into reality using the one instrument you've been practicing since birth, your voice. Make more of the music you love without having to worry about how to get your ideas into your DAW. Before the doubler even sponsored this podcast, I picked it up just because I'm a geek about technology. And I personally picked up the doubler studio kit, which allows you to hum a melody, a synth pattern, or even beatbox one shots right into FPC if you use FL Studio or whatever DAW that you're using. This also allows you to manipulate effects and filters in a way that only the voice can. To get the Studio Doubler kit, all you gotta do is access getdoubler.com forward slash Curtis King. Okay, music producers, once again, shout out to our sponsor, Voclia Doubler. Let's get into the last five of this list of how to make beats or cook up beats more consistently. So we left off on how to, you know, how to keep a level head about your beats and the necessity of that. Now, number six is record your voice notes, record voice notes and actually use them. That second part is what this is really about. That's the real MVP in this one. Record your voice notes and actually use them. I hear producers when I suggest, hey, do you record voice notes into your phone, right? Do you, you know, record beat ideas into your phone? Yeah, I do that all the time. Do you use them? I mean, I use it before like one or two times. No, use the damn voice notes. What's the purpose of these ideas if you're not using the voice notes? For those of you that are using the voice notes, good for you. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. But for those of you that are making these voice notes and it just feels good because you feel like you're working on something, but you what are we doing? What are we doing? Why are we acting like we got forever to live? Fam, get there and use them voice notes. Import them directly. FL Studio. I don't know whatever every other doll, but FL Studio has this thing that allow you to. Uh, what am I talking about? Voclia Doubler will allow you to do that. If you have a voice note and you hear it, you could recreate it literally instrument by instrument by using. Aha, the Zivaklia Doubler. Zivaklia Doubler. But if you don't have that at the moment, what you could also do is take that audio signal. And if you go into Edison, it has a option or not Edison. Uh, yeah, Edison. It has an option that allows you to turn audio into a MIDI signal and dump it into your piano roll. It's not 100 percent accurate. It's not as fire as the Doubler, but it'll do. So use your voice notes. That is you trying to capture lightning in a bottle. You get an idea that you're like, I think there's something really strong here or something that has the potential. Actually use them. 
And if it doesn't sound good the first time you try to recreate that in an actual beat, that's fine. You always have it to go back to. But do something with it is my point. So that's the sixth one. The seventh one. Hyper focus on one subsection of your beat making process. Melodic loops, drum loops, etc. Leave a little for the next day. So one thing that I always suggest is every day that you're sitting down to make beats does not have to be dedicated to just making beats. You could have a melody loop making day. And you'll probably get a lot more done when you hyper focus on one subcategory of beat making. Maybe you dedicate your session today to just making drum loops. Maybe you dedicate it to just compiling, just compiling one shots that you like the most and reorganizing your drum sounds. Right. We've talked about that before. But whatever you do, hyper focus on one subsection. And when you hyper focus, what's going to happen is that one, you will make more music. Different types of vibes, different types of soundscapes, but also you will leave a little for yourself the next day. To 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 relay, right, like it's like relay runners, you take that, but you take that baton, but boom, they pass it to you, you pass it to yourself. Now, the next day you're sitting making a beat, you've passed along some valuable information, some valuable music that is going to give you momentum. So for those of you that are. In 2021, still anti loops will create your own, create them on, create them. Say, say that you only have four days out of the week to work, right? Say it's Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. Then what you do on Monday can be a cheat code for what happens on Wednesday. So give yourself the opportunity to actually get a jump start on the next day by hyper focusing on one sub subcategory. So maybe today's that day where you say, you know what? I don't need to make one complete beat when I could literally use my own self as an assembly line. And then also creatively, I got to tell you when I have days like that, where I make nothing but melodic loops, I feel like I walk away from those sessions a lot more full. I feel like I walk away from those sessions feeling like, yeah, I got the most out of my day. Right. And I think at the end of the day, that's the whole point of making lists. That's the whole point of doing the work we do. We want to be able to walk away from there and say, yeah, yeah. OK, I did my job. I, I did what I was supposed to do. I got the most I squeezed the most juice that I could out of this day. So absolutely hyper focus on one subcategory. Next, collaborate with producers just like you. I think many times producers, because we have access you know, this generation of producers have access to any producer they can think of with an email, with a manager or somebody to reach out to or somebody that you've always respected. Maybe it's a YouTuber. Maybe it's, you know, somebody like myself. Because you have access to them, you feel like that's the collaboration that you need to get done first. And that's not the collaboration you need to get done first. The one you need to get done first is the one that is excited about working with you the one that is looking for you, the one that is already local to you, the one that is probably the closest to you, the ones that are already tuning into what you're doing. Collaborate amongst your own community first. Build that up, right? Because what's going to happen is that when you want to make beats more consistently, it's not always a solo job. It's a team effort. So involve other people so that they can be a part of this team experience. But that doesn't always have to be folks that are higher up on this proverbial ladder, right? People that are further down the road on their journey. You don't have to make them the first priority. Make the folks that are already rocking with you first priority. Look at them comments that you're getting. If you're only getting three comments, but you consistently see one guy or one lady that's always hitting you up and always, you know, giving you props. Why don't you start there? Because I guarantee you, even when you meet a producer that is not as fire as you. There is something that you're going to see with what they're doing that is going to inspire something new within what you already do, right? So ensure that you are collaborating first where it makes sense. Producers that are just like you. And then as you start to get your footing in that, as you start to build up your catalog with that, as you start to sort of absorb new ways of making beats, absorb new rhythms, absorb new approaches to making music, 
then you're going to move up naturally. You're going to grow. And as you grow, you work with the folks that are like you once again. And if you dig, do get opportunities along the way to work up a little bit further along your journey with somebody that's a little bit more experienced than by all means. But I think trying to force that issue is also a deterrent when it comes to you making beats more consistently. So the work doesn't always have to fall on you. Collaborate. I mean, if you're not already doing that, I mean, you are if you are doing that, you already know what the benefits of it are. But if you're not. What do you mean where to find collaborators? The Internet, <laughs> the whole ass Internet. You know what I'm saying? Like, look, look at those folks. Here's where I say for those folks that are spamming you. Here's an opportunity instead of getting annoyed with them, here's an opportunity for you to say, all right, bro, let's work. And if they don't respond, block them. But if they do. Let's work. Check the workout and let's go. Just work. But I think that it's important for you, no matter how skilled a producer is collaborative, collaboratively. I think it's great for you to always use every experience to sharpen your pencil, to sharpen your sword. So work, work, work with them and see if there's something that, they, that if, see if there's something there that you can learn that maybe you didn't know before. So that's something I highly suggest. Collaborate with producers like you. Number nine. Separate, and I talked a little bit about this in one of the other uh, numbers, but separate your research time from your creation time. I think so many times when we're sitting down to make music, we have our mind set on, I'm going to make music. But then we allow the distractions, we allow, but then we allow the distractions to distract us. And when we allow that to happen, we end up going down a rabbit hole. And it's a rabbit hole that I am not one that is above that for sure. It happens to me, especially when I'm sitting here mixing or doing something that's not necessarily my favorite thing to do. It happens. I'll get on my phone and I'll check one DM or I check one email. Email is the worst for me. Email will literally lead me into one place that leads me into another place that leads me to another place that leads me to checking the website, changing the website that leads me to checking Stripe and checking PayPal. That leads me, it just will lead you down a rabbit hole. So it's important that you separate your creation time from your research time, from your information retrieval time, from whatever you want to consider time away from music. It's important that you separate the two and understand when you're actually walking away from the create creative experience that is. So for me, I will turn my phone on airplane mode when I know that I'm mixing because there's just way too many distractions. Even right now, I had a text message come through and I'm like, I got to put on airplane mode because of our experience right now to stay fully invested into this experience and focus. It's important for me to shut those things off and tell myself, tell my brain, look, it is creation time. It is not research time, right? If I do not know how to do something, what would I have done if I didn't have Internet? Right. Sometimes our luxuries, you know, uh, uh, end up being our, 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 our biggest obstacles. And so if I was sitting in this session, right, and say I don't like the way my 808 slides are going. If I didn't have Internet, right, because normally when you, when you have Internet, you have access to your phone, you just do a little YouTube search. OK, that's how I do it. All right, cool. Let's go. And then we do it and we hyper focus so much on that that we realize we feel a little bit different about the entire beat, the beat in its, in its entirety. When I asked the question, what would I have done had I not had my cell phone on me? Had I not had Internet access? Would I have just stopped working on the beat or would I have, I don't know, take a risk and experiment it? Would I have, I don't know, uh, take a chance and, you know, do it the wrong way, find a new way? Maybe go to an old session where I did do this thing. Or would I try to do something else that gives me the same vibe, right? Maybe I, I mess around with the portamento and glissando within the actual VST. Maybe that's what I'll do. But I think that it's important for you to separate so that you can hyper focus and then also put yourself in the best possible position to lock into your flow state. Because when you're locked into your flow state, you're talking about having such a such a A carefully curated focus that internal 
and external distractions just melts away from around you. You don't know about time. You're not thinking about time. You're not thinking about the food you haven't eaten. You probably not even worried about going to the bathroom, which is that's unhealthy. But if you're probably not even worried about that, because when you're so into what you're doing. Not only does it enhance the music itself, but it also makes that experience fulfilling and worthwhile. So if you want to make beats more consistently, fire beats, you got to focus. That's an obvious one, but we got to make sure that we that we separate our research time from our creation time. There's some there's some exceptions to the rule, but nine times out of ten, you need to keep your butt right there with the music and where it's at. Number ten. This is my favorite one, and this is something I kind of got into in my last stream, and I'm going to put the phone down for this one. Cook beats like grandma. Oh, Curtis, you back and your Curtis back. Cook beats like your grandmother. Every grandmother is not the same, but there's a lot of grandmother, grandmothers that are very similar. And um, rest in peace to my grandmother. Today would have been her birthday uh, on the recording of this. But. A few things I remember about my grandmother cooking, especially during holiday seasons, is that let's use uh, let's use Thanksgiving. So during Thanksgiving, my grandmother would get in that she would get in that kitchen, and she didn't want anybody else in there that was not assisting her or adding to the momentum of what she was building when she started cooking. She'd get up like six or seven in the morning for Thanksgiving dinner, right? dinner, right? 6 a.m. in the morning. That's how she would get up. She would get up and she would start preparing things. She would start boiling things. She would start putting the turkey in the oven. She would start preparing all these different things. And if you walked in there, it would look like it's disorganized. You got pots over here and pans over here. You got mixing bowls and, and they got like, you know what I'm saying? They got like some, some, some cake batter splattered all over them. It looks chaotic walking into the kitchen. But you better not touch nothing because she knows exactly where everything is at. It looks chaotic. But when you see the end result of what she has been cooking. Right. And we're going to we, we need to talk about also, too, before we even get to the end result, let's talk about the way that she cooks it. Right. Aside from the disorganization in your eyes of the pots and the pans, d- besides you know, having these things here, these things here. Also, the way that she measures things. I don't think that I've ever seen, you know, when she was here, I don't think I ever saw my grandmother use a measuring cup. She would take whatever she was using, salt, seasoned salt, pepper, you know, what I'm saying, and salt bay that she would just a little bit of that, a little bit of that. Grandma, why you ain't using a measuring glass? I don't need no measuring glass. I got my hand. I know exactly how to put it. I know what it, I know what it's supposed to taste like. I know what I know how much to put in there. I've been doing this for years. Put a little sprinkle of that, a little sprinkle of that. And it's like you sit there and you watch, and you're like, how do you know how much is enough? I want you to relate that to a producer. Because fast forwarding that that analogy of grandmother's cooking, you see the end result? You going to eat regardless. It smells amazing, right? The dishes will eventually get done. I'll probably end up being the one doing the dishes as a grandson, but the dishes are already done. But you look at the end result of what's on the table and you're like, good God, I don't care how it was made. This looks delicious. This looks amazing. I think there's something to learn from that for us as producers, because I think so many producers If you flip the scenario around, don't cook up their beats in the same natural and home style way that grandmother would. Right. So you think about a producer that cooks up a beat. They sit down there and they're sitting in front of their doll and their doll is obviously their their cooking utensils, their their MIDI keyboard, their mounts. They sit there in front of their doll and. They try to decide, OK, well, well, you know, very similar. We try to decide what meal we're going to cook. OK, we're going to cook up a, a UK drill or we're going to cook up an R&B or we're going to cook up a trap. So, OK, we're going to cook up. So, OK, we're going to cook this up. Cool. Well, I need these ingredients. OK, that's still kind of like grandma. Get these ingredients. And then once you get the ingredients, you start 
pulling out the measuring cup. Well, how much low end should I add to the? Wait a minute, what are we doing? How much snap should I add to this snare? Wait a minute, what, what are we doing? How many? Like, what is the correct type of hi hats? Wait, wait, what are we doing? How do we get so detached from the natural? faith that we're supposed to have in our craft. And for many of you, maybe this doesn't relate because you're still very early in your journey. You got to get your, you know, you got to get your, uh, your experience in, but how do we get to a point where, where we become so, Oh no, no, no. I must make sure that I measure the correct amount of EQ and the correct amount of cutting of the low end and the correct amount of high pass filter. Yes. It's only right. If I get that, wait a minute, it's clipping. It's clipping. You hear that? It's clipping. Please, please skim a little bit off of that. Okay. Make it a half a cup. Exactly. You already know what that's going to taste like. If that was, if that producer was cooking a meal, you already know what that's going to taste like. Bland, bland, bland tofu in a water. That's, that's, that's a brick of tofu in a cup of water. Bland. <laughs> and so many of you cook like that. You don't trust your instinct. And many of you don't trust your instinct because you just haven't been doing it long enough. But many of you have been doing this a long time and you still don't trust your instinct. You still feel like if I move too fast in one direction, doing something that feels a little bit too much like fun, I'm going to break something. I'm going to break momentum. I'm going to break my beat. I'm going to break my da. And these were made to be unbreakable, indestructible. You need to learn how to cook like grandma so that the food, the final product, the music that comes at the end of that. Oh, man. Makes it all well worth it. But as long as you are inching, inching, inching by even Gordon Ramsay, right? Let's not let's take grandma off the equation. Gordon Ramsay. He, he, he has people prepare meals for him. And they do all the measuring and then he gets it and he's like, this tastes like shit. <laughs> what is this? this? Bloody hell. This tastes like shit. Like, why is that? They've lost the soul that is required to make the, the, the food that hits you in the soul. So I say it's the same thing for producers. Do not take out the most important ingredient, which is your trust and faith within your own craft, which is your risk-taking ability, which is your audacity to trust your ideas, your audacity to have creative ideas and to stay creative, even if it feels like it's not within the confines of the current time that you're living in. The audacity is what it's all about. I think, that, I think this is also why I get so frustrated with um, producers that come into my live streams. And I know it's the internet. I get it. Blah, blah, I get it. But I get so frustrated with producers that come into my kitchen and try to tell me that I'm cooking at too high a temperature. If you don't get your ass out of my get, like my grandma used to get your ass out of this kitchen. If you don't leave, what are you doing? Get out of my kitchen. Go cook something for yourself. You know all of that about cooking. Go cook something about yourself. Go cook something for yourself and nourish your body. Because this right here ain't for you. It ain't for you. If you don't like the way it's being prepared, go to another kitchen. But in, as far as me and my house, like my grandma used to say, as far as me and mine in my house, we're going to cook the way we cook. And the faith that I have within the time that I've put in, I respect way too much to allow someone who's skimming a little bit off the top and is doing everything by the proper measurement. Like, have you ever made Kool-Aid a day in your life? I had Kool-Aid in a long time, but I remember when I used to make Kool-Aid religiously as a kid, we wasn't worried about no measuring cups. You kept pouring sugar until you until it tastes right. Who care what the package says? Do it do it smack? Nah, bro. It, it, mm -mm, mm -mm. And you put a little bit more, you be like, mm, it's getting closer, it's getting closer. Pour a little, ooh, it's getting closer. Ooh, damn. <laughs> now nah, I can't go to sleep. And I'm finna have a sugar crash. That's probably a bad analogy, but you get what I'm saying. Like, you ever made a, a, a batch of Kool-Aid? And if you did, was it, was it the most bland ever? Because if you apply the same technique that you have to music production, 
right? Tight butt cheeks and all that. If you apply the same technique to, to, to making Kool-Aid, I could only imagine how dry that is. I'm going to just stare at you for a sec. If you want to make beats on a more consistent basis, loosen up your butt cheeks, okay? Take all that extra pressure that's not needed. The overall goal with this is to remove distractions. The overall goal of this is to study what has already worked. The overall goal of this really is for you to just trust in yourself. Trust that even when things are not going according to plan, they're going somewhere. And if you trust your ears and you know what sounds good and what doesn't sound good, allow the journey to happen. And if the end result is not quite what you like, there's a button in every DAW called that, that, that when you hit file, drop down menu, and it says new project, open up a new one. Thank you for watching and or listening to the new episode of the Curtis King podcast. I hope you enjoyed today. Today was a little bit, a little bit lengthy. They've been kind of getting there, but I've been enjoying doing these more long form podcasts. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to really get ideas that are just circulating inside my mind. And I hope you enjoyed it. I, I appreciate everybody that's been keeping up. That's been leaving comments. I'm starting to see that the audience is building and that more and more of you are sharing and leaving commentary on the uh, traditional podcasting platforms if you haven't by now please leave us a rating please make sure that you leave a comment and let folks know get a glimpse from you they don't want to hear from me they want to hear from you right they want to hear from other producers of how beneficial this may be for you if it's not then don't even worry about it just you know go about your business uh but either do that or just come over here to the youtube either no do both come to the youtube hit the like button share leave a comment and uh, I would like to know, are there any other tips that you have for making beats more consistently? For those of you that have been smacking these leaderboards on the beat timer, I'm sure that you have some advice. I'm looking at you, HCC and T-Sketch and uh, uh, One Little Diesel and Decipher. I'm looking at all y'all who are over here dominating. And it's like another name. I'm sorry if I missed that other name. There's another name on here who's dominating. So we would love to hear from y'all and even more folks. Uh, and uh, let's 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 continue to cook like grandma. In this life, you would not be full of life until you decide to live life to its fullest. Once again, this is Curtis King of Slap Experts. We got a new plugin coming this week, ladies and gentlemen. That is Tape Boy on April first, April first, April first, April Fool's Day. For real, for real, for real. But you'll get a little bit more information on that soon. Have a good one.